What will it take to deliver on the promises of Web3? Well, we'll wait till Quantum really comes around in the mainstream <laughs> before we expect it to go. It's a big mind. There's a lot of centralization going on. Um, what, what we'd like to do is that we're starting to produce a short little snippet. You know, the theme that we're taking on here is what will it take to deliver on the promises of Web3? Um, yeah. what, what do you think the promise of Web3 really is and what and, and what will it take to make well, it real? Well, Web3 is a slogan, so it's not clear what it means. But uh, I think the main thing is you really want integrated payments on the web. And you want it to be in an actually secure way. So like there are a lot of things that people don't pay for on the web because the end user cost of doing the payment is way too much, <laughs> like ridiculous. Uh, that you have to have a credit card, take out your credit card, enter your credit card and trust this thing that you're putting your credit card in to not start taking way too much money for, from you, which despite what credit card companies claim, it's still largely on you to be careful with your credit card number online. So that's a huge problem. Now, you kind of have this on mobile that once you get payments set up on mobile, you're kind of good that, you know, someone's cutting 30% off the top, <laughs> but you can have real payment things where you, it is verified with you how much you're paying for things every time you do it. Uh, and when you have a subscription, you can cancel at any time without the other side being told the moment you cancel, they only get told when the payment was supposed to happen and then it just doesn't happen right then. Uh, so what you really want to have is something like that from a UX experience, but available on the web, not locked into a particular app store and without somebody taking 30% off the top. That would be really What's nice. it going to take for us to like get to that point? Because there's a lot of integrations, cross-chain interoperability, a lot of other stuff. What is it? What are the real stumbling blocks to making that a reality in the next couple of years? You need something with good custody and reasonable performance, and uh, so that like people aren't afraid of just like losing their keys and losing everything. So there are reasonable procedures for regaining access to your stuff. If you lose it, and it also needs to have of payments go through like immediately and it has to have um, good scaling uh, uh, properties so it can be used by millions of people. If we're talking about web three, presumably this needs to be on the web. So it needs that kind of scale of payments. So for that, we need, basically we need a good payment channel network <laughs> to be up and running. So we don't have that yet. Um, and uh, we just had an offsite discussing payment channel networks. And really for a full scale, you need not just payment channel network, but you need like channel factories and other stuff to, to really be up and running, to really achieve full scaling on it. Um, yeah, so there's this necessary infrastructure kind of in two directions where like this doesn't need the thing I'm describing is very is much simpler than like NFTs and a lot of that stuff people talk about. It's just simple money. And if you look at like what doesn't have Bitcoin, what doesn't Bitcoin have that you would need to enable this? Because Bitcoin is the thing that's claiming to just be simple money. It's really better custody solutions and um, a, a payment channel network that's like built up and truly scaled up. Great, thank you. Hey, um, I just finally got a YubiKey and uh, I'm looking at doing that and the ones with the biometrics in it, I could see uh -huh. actually that YubiKey being like the pseudo credit card when I go to a machine or to a point of sale and when we're in the real world. Is that sort of the future you see for offline chain payments or is there something else when we get to that point of the world? Well, YubiKeys, if you're talking about... Um... Uh, credit-based systems. A YubiKey really kind of uh, gets you there in a big way, right? Instead of a credit card number, you should have a YubiKey that you plug in and, and you're good to go, or hopefully not have to have like physical contact. But, but for 
payments, you kind of want more that like you want it to be that the you, the end users, see the amount of payment that you're making <laughs> and sign off on it and can check in on it again later and see what's going on and hopefully get a receipt for it right when you get it, that, that the receipt is transferred directly to your device when you make your payment so that you have all of them. Um, so that requires a little bit more than a YubiKey. Like a phone should be able to do it just fine. There are these new phone payment things, but they're still based off of um, credit cards as the rails that it's built on top of. No, it's the awesome. QR codes being the winner there either, right? But no, no, because, well, QR codes are not bad because like as just a way of making it contactless, they work fine, right? That, that you want, that there's something that's charging you for something. So it shows you a QR code and your phone goes and, you know, uh, does the payment and everything. Um, especially if you're talking about something that's very immediate, the QR code just has to get your phone to go to the right place, right? It's just a way of getting information to your phone, but your phone's online. So all the QR code really has to do is just give you a URL that's going to go bad in five minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, those are, QR codes are pretty good for that specific use of, of payment. So that if some, what, some machine wanted to ask you for something, it would do it by showing you a QR code and you pull out your phone. That does have the problem that someone standing behind you could pull out their phone <laughs> and scan the QR code. Um, but, it's, but it's not a bad solution. 